morning. Good morning. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church of Monticello. Um, are there any announcements? Yes. I just wanted to let everybody know that our garden is overflowing with tomatoes and okra, and I brought some for you all. If you want to make yourself a nice hot uh, bowl of soup, it's in that overflow area. Thanks. Good morning. It is harvest season, and that means that Christmas can't be too far away. <laughs> uh, is, that's also the time of year that it is time for the faith in action fruit and nut and candy sale. And so today will be the first of four Sundays that I'll be taking orders for that after church. And as always, faith in action appreciates all your support. Thank you. I have two announcements. Um, one is that next week is the uh, Friends Creek outing, so don't forget about that. It's 3 o'clock till dusk, so um, if you want to bring a side dish, great. Otherwise, there will be food for everybody, um, so please come out and enjoy that. And then the other announcement I want to make real quick is that Jane's um, cross-country team won sectional yesterday and they made it to state. So, um, Way to go, Jane. Um, on behalf of the deacons, I'm um, letting you know that we will be writing um, Gifts, food gift certificates for the holidays. We'll be writing them on November 3rd. If you would like to, I know there are many of you that like to um, donate extra money to the Deacons Fund. This would be a time to do it. Just write your check to First Presbyterian Church. And in the bottom memo, make sure you write Deacons Fund. So if we could get that extra money by November 1st, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Let me know if you have any questions. Okay, thanks for those messages. Okay, um, please join me in the call to worship from Psalm 98. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Bring forth a joyous song to the Lord of hosts. Let the world roar in all that fills it. With the and the sound of horns, let us make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let us worship God together. Please stand if you're able and join in singing hymn number 469, Morning Has Broken. <laughs> Dear God, 
We know that we do not always honor you in our relationships, and so we pray for grace when we fall short of the command to love each other as you have loved us. Give us patience with each other and patience with our own failings. Grant to us wisdom, gentleness, and honesty as we live within our families and with all who are part of the human family. Make where we live havens of nurture, encouragement, and support. And so grant us your grace in every relationship of life that we may live in love and walk in faith. <coughs> Friends, hear these comforting words. If you repent and believe in God's redeeming mercy, your sins are forgiven. Trust in God's promises and begin a new year life with God in all. In the name of Jesus Christ, thanks be to God for this grace. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 
I don't think we say it often enough to the choir, but thank you so much for sharing your gifts with us. Uh, today's scripture lesson, uh, the first one is from Mark 12, uh, chapter, chapter 12, verses 28 through 34, about the greatest commandment. One of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength. And to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any question. The word of the Lord. verses of scripture I'm going to read in addition to what we had, and then I have some questions. So, this is from the Bible, Mark chapter 9. They came to Capernaum, they came to a place, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the road? But they kept quiet because on the way they were arguing about who was the greatest. And sitting down, Jesus called the twelve and said, anyone who wants to be first must be the very last and the servant of all. And they took a little child whom he placed among them. Taking the child in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. So, here, here's the question. Can you tell me how you got here to the church today? Car? Anybody work? Fine? Car? Okay, car. Alright, for those who got here by the car, did you personally drive the car? You're not sexy, okay. Okay. Okay, forgot about six. Okay. All right, so can't try to do it. All right, they didn't give you a license or anything. A lot of years. A lot of years. A lot of years. Okay. <laughs> so if you can't drive, how did you get? How do you get to work in the morning? Bikes or our boss or someone brings you. Your boss brings you. Okay, that's great. So yeah, maybe. I mean, maybe like you drive. Okay, motorcycle. Okay. So. But where do, where do you go to work? Oh, so you go to school, you don't go to work? You go to middle school? Oh, okay, okay. Well, if you can't drive and you don't go to work, then how do you buy food to eat? Parents do. Parents do. Yeah, you know, okay, yeah. Parents do, that's great, okay. So you're telling me other people get you food? Yeah, yeah. Yes, <laughs> okay, all right. So that's really nice of them, isn't it? Yes, okay. So, so I'm asking some silly questions here. Uh, and you recognize this. And this meant to help us remember how that we need each other's help. So I bring this up today and this scripture. This is where we hear Jesus' disciples seem to have forgotten that they need each other's help. We know that we have, that they forgot to, they, they needed each other's help because they're having an argument who's the greatest and the best. They were thinking about being the greatest and the best is about thinking how well you can do things on your own, by yourself, because if others are helping you to do something, then it seems like then you aren't the greatest and best individual. 
which is why Jesus has to remind his disciples, saying, being the best and the greatest does not welcome me or God into your life. In other words, Jesus is telling his disciples to stop, to stop being know-it-alls and to instead be more like kids, to be people who know that they could use some help from time to time. Okay, <laughs> accepting help may seem like something simple to do, but it is really important for all of us to remember to practice. When we know we need help and ask for it, then we are much better at accepting that help. So this is so important. I'm going to say it in a slightly different way. When we know we need God's help, then we are much better at accepting God's help. And when we do accept God's help, then our best will become even better. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who teaches us and shows us how to do our best by asking for and accepting your help. Thank you and amen. All right, thank you for coming out. scripture lesson comes from Acts chapter 15 verses 1 through 7 of the council at Jerusalem. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. Tom R. has said, I stood on the playground of a Hawthorne Elementary School in Atlanta. We were picking teams for kickball, a staple in my sixth grade phys ed class. It was my third day as a Hawthorne Hornet, as my family had just moved from Alabama. And one by one, each kid was picked. You know where this is going. I didn't get picked. Fortunately, at my age, I'm no longer scarred by that moment of rejection, but the truth is, I still remember it. There's a lot about sixth grade that is washed from a memory so clearly that it is as if it never happened. But that November day in 1971, I still remember. When you are told, we don't need you, it's hard to forget. It is the upcoming Christmas season when we particularly celebrate that God couldn't bear to stay away from this world that God created out of love. God can bear to stay away from you, whom God created out of them. And so we will share again from this pulpit and from this sanctuary that the love of God was born in an ordinary night to a world that was not only took a little notice, but a world that made no room for God. Fortunately, this would not be something that Jesus would remember, he would hear about it, but he surely came to know that the world he loved had no room for him. So later in his life, a Bible professor, a man who spent his life studying the scriptures, came to Jesus and asked, what is the most important commandment? It wasn't hard for Jesus to answer. You are to love the Lord God with all that you are, and you are to love your neighbor as if your neighbor's welfare matters as much as your own. The Bible scholar says, that's exactly right, Jesus. And Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom. Now, there's no surprise here. You learn this in vacation Bible school, if your parents were the type to send you to such. We know that our lives are defined by love. So when this man poses his question, we might think, oh, call on me. I know that one. It's love. It's love. We, too, might be not far from the kingdom. We did not forget this one. 
And the ups and downs of our lives, we have endured much that we would call difficult and maybe even things we wish we would for a kid. But that can be risky. Sometimes difficult circumstances teach us things about ourselves and about our faith that are not as easy to see when things are well. Let me share a couple of things that help whether we are going through good or difficult seasons. This first passage calls us to be a good friend. I hope as we go through life that we might remember friendship is not simply an experience, but a practice. Let our calendars reflect our hearts, meaning let us know how we spend our time to be doing what we believe. When our Bible student gets all the answers right, Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom. If I understand the text, the not far is a signal that there is more to faith than knowing the right answers. The word is to be lived. I hope that as our lives unfold, we're given opportunities to live our friendships, to practice kindness and support and share life together. Love is not something we think, it is something we do. It takes time and intentionality. I want to be intentional about communicating to the people that I love, that that I love them, but I'm not that good at it. The first thing the good book says is that it is not good to be alone. One of the ordination vows asked of our new elders is, will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry? Being a friend is holy work. But there's a second thing about this holy word that I find relevant for this season, particularly because this word is spoken by one for whom the world has no room. In addition to being a good friend, I think Jesus also calls us to be a good citizen. Part of loving our neighbors is paying attention to those for whom the world has no room. That is part of the social unrest that we witness. There are many who raise their voices during these political campaigns to say that they are being ignored by the march of American culture. These many recent years have shown us a paradoxical economic reality. The stock market has climbed in dramatic fashion. At the same time, we have witnessed unprecedented and unaddressed needs all across the country. There are millions of people who depend on food pantries food stamps and needed help. Every year, the benefits of the economy continue to become more and more concentrated among fewer and fewer, while increasingly citizens at the bottom half of the economy find no escape route. This growth in poverty is not just an economic problem, it is a spiritual problem. Sasha Sasha Abramsky is a journalist who spent over a year documenting the stories of the poor. He wrote, there's a loneliness to poverty. Poverty pushes people to the psychological and physical margins of society, isolated from friends and relatives, shunned into dilapidated, dilapidated trailer parks, shanties, or ghettoized public housing, and removed from banks and stores, transit systems, and cultural institutions. They cannot afford to vary their routines of their daily lives. Embarrassed by the poverty, worried about being judged, failures in life, and humiliated by that judgment, Many told me that they withdrew from, from all but essential social interactions. Ann Case and uh, Angus Beaton are both economists at Princeton, and they found the, same, the shame of poverty is at times devastating. They report that after a century of virtually steady increase, from 2014 to 2017, life expectancy in the U.S. stalled and even declined. The problem, the research indicates, is what they labeled the deaths of despair. These are deaths resulting from suicide, overdoses, or alcoholism. The surge is found in largely blue collar communities that have been left behind in an economy where the rest of us have no room. I can't imagine those numbers will improve in 2025. Michael Sandel, a moral philosopher at Harvard, says that part of what has happened is the poor know the American narrative. And it says anyone can, if not rise from rags to riches, at least make it economically if you only try. So if you are poor, it's your own fault, is what this book says. Finding little prospects other than food pantries. In 2016, for one year's example, more Americans died of these deaths of despair every two weeks and died of 18 years of war in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now I know, nothing makes us more nervous than talking about the economy. It is for some a holy idol that cannot be questioned, regardless of the results. But in Christian faith, talk about money is always talk about people. You can turn on the evening news and see the stories of people on the edge or read about what has happened. A food pantry volunteer once wrote, it is moving to watch people tearfully express how grateful they are for the help of basic necessities like food. 
but it is humbling to talk to people who have never had to ask for food before and are so embarrassed that they can barely look at me. I believe giving will continue to be necessary to any of the services and ministries that you are led, led to give to. And food pantries can only address hunger, they can't address the shame. After so many years of giving, some things have gotten better, but many things have not. And too many are ever fragile as they try to hold on to the, the dignity of human life. Christ teaches that our neighbor's welfare matters as much as our own. And of course we know that. And because we know that, Jesus might say that we are not far from the kingdom. Now that sounds good, but the truth is he was not far from the inn. And it's just that there was no room in the inn. When it comes to the ever-increasing number of neighbors who find no room in the American inn, we need to do more than blame them for their poverty. Like that chilly day in November 1971 when Thomas told, we don't need you, I imagine Jesus knew that the world had no room for him. Because he did, he had a soft spot in his heart for those the world leaves behind. We should too. I wish I could give you the answer to as to how to change this. My light has not shined down that path very far. But we have been shown that it is no longer okay to assume that increased poverty is acceptable. If we are smart, we might rise to the top. But if we are good, if we are righteous, we might also see that those who don't rise to the top and do what we can to make room for them. So many years of our lives are teachers. For some, 2020 was their great teacher. COVID was hard enough, but then things got harder. There are many teachable moments. For some, it was 2021. For many, maybe not a calendar year, but some other time in their lives they went through an episode that left them changed. Now, I want to reflect on the conversations that we may have had around difficult topics like poverty, aid, or racism, or other political hot topics. I know you're very excited about this. I have had conversations about difficult topics. I'm sure you have too. Some of them good, some of them not. I want to reflect on what gets in our way and helps us from learning from one another. These recent years have taught us something about that. This illustration is also from Tom R. He says, one of my favorite teachers was Mrs. Hurst. She was my 11th grade history teacher and is fully responsible for me by being a history major in college. She liked to pose a question for general discussion. The questions always seemed easy, at least at first. Was Thomas Jefferson good for America? Well, that's easy. Of course, he's one of our heroes. Drafter of the Declaration of Independence. He was founder of the University of Virginia, and John Adams vice president, and our third president. I would make my case, and she would say, well, that's a very strong case, Tom. But what do you think about his own new slaves? I forgot about that. And he fathered children with his slave Sally Hemings. Yeah, that's not good. Did you know he literally cut verses out of the Bible, removing all the parts he didn't like? It's called the Jefferson Bible. I didn't know that. About the time she had, had changed my mind, she would then take the side I had just abandoned. You didn't mention that he drafted the state of Virginia statute on religious freedom that lies behind the First Amendment. Don't you think the country is better off with that? I couldn't figure out what the right answer was. And that was exactly her point. She taught valuable lessons. She taught me that real life is complicated. She, that the truth is never simple. In addition, because things that matter are often complicated, we should expect to have to change our minds along the way. And that is never easy. Our second passage this morning tells of us of a time when truth wasn't simple and conversation was hard. But the leaders of the church discussed it and changed their minds. It was not an easy meeting. There was deep disagreement as they debated what it meant to be Christian. They were debating who they understood themselves to be at their very core. When it was over, they changed their minds and they changed their ways. It's an amazing moment of faith, maybe even a miracle. Saul has a convert, uh, conversion on the Damascus Road. Remember, he takes a new name, Paul, and asserts that God has appointed him to proclaim Christ to the Gentiles. And that's an odd thing to say, proclaim Christ to the Gentiles, because Christ is a title. It's not a last, last name, Jesus Christ, son of Joe and Mary Christ. No, it's Jesus the Christ. Jesus is Greek for the Hebrew word Messiah. To affirm that Jesus is the Christ is to affirm that he is the long-for, anticipated one of the Jewish faith. So to worship Jesus as the Christ is to practice Judaism in a sense. 
But here Paul wants to welcome Gentiles. That has never happened before. Folks said, we can't do that. That would turn our faith upside down. That was a conversation. Some things are hard to talk about. 2020 and 2021 and recent years and months brought us a lot that was hard to talk about. So much of what we try to talk about comes preloaded. I've been reflecting on what gets in our way when we disagree. My hope is to bring light to difficult places. What are the barriers that get in our way to keep us from learning, growing, maybe even changing our minds? I can lift up four barriers to growth, and you know, you know that makes the others. The first barrier that I see to progress is defensiveness. I don't think anything makes me more defensive than to feel I am being characterized wrongly, or as labeled as something bad. There is within me an immediate need to assert, I'm not that label, whatever it may be. I'm not like that. But right away, I'm on thin ice. Because what I have asserted is that I am trying to decide what that label is. Now, what in my personal experience am I going to draw to define what is and is not that thing? No, I need to pause a moment, take a breath, and think about this. See if this makes sense to you. I think we meet someone who is not like us. The difference can be almost anything, really. A uh, different age or religion. A uh, different economic status or political party. When I meet someone who is, in my judgment, different from me, it is harder for me to see the full humanity of that person. Not impossible, but harder. I have to work overtime to see that not like me person is a child of God. And I might not even know that I have that work to do because my view seems totally natural. As a result, my capacity to dismiss another person's ideas or experience or even worth becomes more reasonable. I think this is a universal struggle for people and it unfortunately paves the way for things like racism. Ibram Kendi is a historian and author on race who has helped so many with this. He says that racist and what he calls anti-racist are not identities actions. They are less about who we are and more about what we do. And if they are actions, then they can change. Rather than become defensive and assert our purity, maybe it's better to ask, in what ways might I have been off? Or like this label that I don't want to be, but I can change tomorrow. A second barrier is shame. When I speak of shame, what I'm talking about is shaming. Our Jerusalem meeting in Acts 15 could have gone south in a number of ways, and shame is one of them. The problem is Jews knew that God had called them to be holy, and they were right. The Hebrew word for, word for holy literally means set apart, not like them. They were not to mix with Gentiles. Don't eat like them, don't pray like them, keep kosher, keep Sabbath, be different. And of course the temptation is to assume difference means I'm better. Paul is standing that on his head. Let them in, he says. It would have been so easy for them to respond. We can't worship with them. God has sent the Messiah to us, to us alone. Don't you see how righteous we are? And that would have been so easy. But they didn't go there. There's been a lot of shame in organizing. Sometimes we demonstrate how woke or aware of where we are by pointing out to the blunders of those around us. We do what Reverend Meg Peary McLaughlin calls virtue signaling. We become a self-appointed teacher of everyone around us and rehearse our anti-racist or anti-whatever. It is that is wrong. It doesn't help. If you want to shut down conversation, movement, then shame. Shame is always a tool that destroys conversation. There's a third reason that conversations like this are difficult. No matter what my position is, I can always spot the weakness, not necessarily in the other position, but in the other person. When I get pushed, I point out the impurity of my adversary. The Jerusalem conversation could have gotten sidetracked this way. One of the elders might have said, we know Paul. Paul persecuted the church. He claims to have had a conversion, but we know him. Paul is the reason my brother or mother or child is in jail. He can't be trusted. They could have stopped the conversation by pointing out the impurity of the apostle. And impurity is always there in every one of us. We so often shut down conversations by ignoring the position while attaching the person. We, came to, we claim that they are biased or an American or a Christian. The conversation is over before we get there. The way the church changed her mind and grew is not by focusing on what was wrong, 
but by looking for what was true and good. Last week I talked about looking for the beautiful and needing more of that. And there's one last thing. Conversations can be difficult when we benefit from the status quo, or at least we think we do. This is how it could have gone wrong in Jerusalem. If we let them in, then we aren't who we have always been. If we let them in, it changes the very core of what it means to worship the Messiah. Let's keep separate. This works since the days of Abraham. I don't know how they got past that. Maybe Paul reminded them that from the very beginning, God called Abraham, and when God called Abraham, God said, you are to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth, to the Gentiles, to them. Maybe they realized that something was lacking in the status quo, that God is always calling us to a new day, a promised day, and we have yet to reach the promised day, so we should expect to change our minds and our ways if we're going to draw closer. We think we benefit from the status quo, but if we remember that God calls his followers to be a blessing to all, then we need some conversation about how to be better at that. Preacher Roger Nishioka went to lunch after church with another pastor, and they laughed and talked about ministry and being with the church. And then somehow the subject of race surfaced. Roger said that at seminary, often when race was discussed, it was presumed to be a black-white issue solely. As a Japanese-American, it left him feeling a bit invisible. The other pastor said, well, maybe that's because of history. After all, the World War II detention centers, they weren't in the South, they were out West. And Roger smiled. And you probably know that smile that I'm talking about. It's a smile that lets you know, and you don't know why, but you know that you're missing something important. Roger said, actually, there was one center for Japanese internment in the South. Do you know where it was? It was in Montreat, North Carolina. Now, Montreat, you may know, is a large conference center for the Presbyterian Church. When the nation decided to hold American citizens of Japanese descent, the Presbyterian Church said, here, let us help. Now, Roger has preached in Montreat. He stayed at the same inn, sleeping in the same rooms where his ancestors were kept. He had led youth camps in prayer in that place, knowing that his ancestors had prayed for liberation it takes courage to live toward God's promise. It takes courage to set aside some of the barriers that so easily get in our way of, of hearing one another, perhaps even hearing the whisper of God from one another. Roger is one who teaches that. I don't know what will happen next year or at the end of this year, much less next month, but you can bet the farm it's going to bring some tender topics our way, things that are hard to talk about. Maybe these last years can teach us to be attentive to one another and to the Spirit. And maybe we won't stumble over the barriers that are so common. The hope is that our conversations will be better. And maybe we'll change our minds about a few things for the better. And who knows? Maybe even something miraculous will occur. Our next hymn is hymn number 22, 22, the certain song, verses 1 through 6. Please stand as we sing.
is run together in the same definition of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He ascended into heaven. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Now is an opportunity to lift up any prayer requests, joys, or concerns. Raise your hand. Uh, microphones come around. We'd love to hear. Our joy is that we welcomed our seventh great grandchild on the eighth in Hawaii. Uh, she's joined by her sister Abby and her parents, uh, Harry and Savannah, and grandparents, Bob and Tracy. I just want to make an announcement about the uh, storm in Florida. Uh, we, they mentioned that we have family and friends uh, there. Uh, everybody is okay physically. There are some minor damages that will have to be taken care of. But I grew up in that area that got hit the hardest, and um, we got to pray for the people. There's a lot of destruction, a lot, and a lot to recover. So let's keep that mindful. I had asked for prayers for a friend of mine who um, lost her home and her vehicle in the first hurricane. And um, believe it or not, her name is Sandy. And uh, so, but she's she went she rented a house and got a rental car, and she and her husband moved in, and the second hurricane got them too. So they flooded out again. But she had a positive post on Facebook today and that she's all right and that they'll be moving forward and I just would like you know, them to be there. Mm -hmm. If there are no other card requests, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we come before you. In the midst of conversations and difficult season and hearing and being reminded of the things going on in the world that are destroying communities and whole swaths of states, we pray uh, here at the outside, uh, outset of this prayer for all those that have been affected by these hurricanes. Uh, we do pray for uh, a full end of this hurricane season that people might be able to get back on their feet. We pray for all groups, agencies, uh, helpers, families, individuals, uh, businesses, all those that are helping, may they be able to be coordinated and be able to get to the people that need it. We're glad to hear of those who have been able to get to a uh, new shelter, even as they've been scrambling from the last hurricane. And we pray that they might be able to find secure shelter and secure transportation and secure means to be able to get to food and to opportunities. And so we pray for communication, logistics, all those that are seeking the help, that they might be able to be on the same page and be able to be as effective as possible. And we pray for all those that are being part of that effort, Presbyterian disaster assistance as well, uh, as well as individual churches. Um, we pray for good communication, that we might be able to, to hear ways that we might be, might be able to serve concretely. Thank you for those uh, groups that have been doing that, uh, that we might be able to be part of those um, uh, rescue and uh, now uh, rebuilding efforts. Uh, as they're going through that, Lord, uh, we, we do pray for, for their help. May your presence and strength be able to help see them through uh, this very difficult season and time. 
With that, Lord, we also want to pray for these prayer requests for those that we know that need uh, health, have health needs of one form or another. And so we lift up and pray for Will Morrison, Ray Williams, Marsha, Madam Walden, Jim and Cindy Witt, Linda Holtz, Mosiers. We also lift up and pray for all those that have been affected by addiction of one form or another and for their next steps and resources for their lives. We pray for peace somehow in Ukraine, Israel, Palestine, and Gaza, for peacemakers, uh, for churches and all those that are part of that effort and may be able to see an ending of the loss of life and destruction uh, by human needs in those areas as well. We continue to pray for those that have been hit by the hurricanes. Lord, we also want to lift up um, uh, different things going on in our congregation for the efforts that deacons make every year, for the uh, writing checks for families as we look forward to turn towards the holiday season. We pray for uh, an effective fundraising campaign for Faith in Action, for the incredible work that they do in our community and in surrounding houses. Uh, they're able to help so many people, and then this way and others that we're able to help fund that. Uh, and so we pray that, that many of our people get the, the funds that they need for local efforts. Uh, we pray for the sign-ups for different events going on in the church so we might be able to have fellowship and to serve others that might find their way to these things at Friends of Creed or the Safe Trick or Treating. Thank you for those opportunities that we might be able to participate in the life of our community and invite others into the life of the community that we have. We pray for the choir and for their warming up for the holiday season as well, for the wonderful cantata that they do and for the ways that they prepare for that even now. Lord, I want to thank you for things going on with the uh, wonderful ways that uh, the local cross country team has done well and gone on the state. We pray for a wonderful meet there, for personal records, and just a wonderful time together as they participate in this and be with the coaches and families as they cheer on uh, the students for that. We pray for the family of, as well of uh, Florence and Mary uh, Macron, uh, who's passed away this last month, and we Pray for them as they're going through all the different emotions and, uh, and loss, even a poor life well lived. We want to uh, uh, pray for all those as well. We would lift up Sandy. We lift up um, those that are trying to get uh, vehicles in the midst of all the great need, again, from the hurricane. We want to thank you for new life and for family and for hearing about that and celebrating. Um, the series and for the ways that we might be able to participate and the things that are going on in our families and enjoy that as we share that and spread smiles upon all our faces. Lord, well, thank you. Thank you for those good news. Lord, we also want to lift up any and all prayer requests we haven't heard out loud. As you bring those faces and situations to our minds and our hearts, we want to see your work in them. And when you have called us to do good works or to be able to speak a word of comfort or a word of love, or a word even of challenge. Give us the courage to do that with the words and actions things that you have supplied for us, that we might be able to spur one another on into those situations, um, bring your love and help. Help us to be your hands and feet. Uh, help us to be able to respond and to be able to see miracles happen. Lord, thank you for the ways that you have prepared for us to do some events. We give you this season. We also want to pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Now is the time in our worship service for the offering of tithes and gifts. Uh, while we listen to the auditory, let us offer ourselves. <laughs>
merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who offered himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 555, Now Thank We All Our God.